Now, what about, though, wasn't all this bank lending and irresponsible lending and uh, all these sorts of deformities that we see in the economy, wasn't this all caused by deregulation? Uh, Wasn't this caused by the absence of a firm hand guiding the economy, that if only we had had that, then maybe this could have been prevented? Well, that indeed is the conventional wisdom, but the difficulty with this claim is that it's actually very hard to find cases of deregulation that are actually relevant to what, what happened. You can find some avenues of deregulation. Uh, for example, about a little over 30 years ago, there was a, an act of deregulation that, that removed the limitation on, on interest rates on savings accounts. Now banks could offer whatever rates they wanted, or they, more or less. Well, that I mean, seems like kind of a stretch to say that 30 years later, that would cause a financial crisis. It doesn't even seem like there's any cause and effect relationship there, but that was one part of deregulation. Uh, removing restrictions on interstate branch banking was another aspect of deregulation. So you could have a, a branch in Nebraska and in New Mexico. Okay, but again, it's not immediately obvious why that would be a source of, of difficulty. Uh, so, in other words, what, what the deregulation that did occur seems to have been more or less irrelevant. Now, the objection that one might advance here is, well, what about this Glass-Steagall thing we hear a lot about? Right? There was, uh, in 1999, there was the partial repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, and this, this caused it. Well, you get this a lot, but even the Washington Post not long ago wrote an article, uh, published an article saying, the Glass-Steagall thing is a total myth and a red herring. The Glass-Steagall was a, was a law that was supposed to put a kind of a firewall between investment banking and commercial banking. So commercial banks are allowed to do certain things, and investment banks are allowed to do certain things, and never the twain shall meet. And they would not be allowed to be owned by the same parent company, could not have both an investment banking uh, part and a, and a commercial banking part, That was forbidden. The partial repeal of this in 1999 removed only this latter provision, that you can't, a single holding company can't have both an investment bank and a commercial bank at the same time. That was removed. That restriction was removed. That was the partial repeal. Does this explain, then, the financial crisis? Does this explain what we observed? Well, for one thing, it's worth noting that a lot of times people uh, who are not supporters of the free market will point to Canada as a great example of a place where they they got through better than the U.S. did, and that's because they were more heavily regulated. And yet, Canada did not have a Glass-Steagall restriction, as did, indeed, if you look at Europe, by and large, you don't see these restrictions there. So that doesn't seem to be just prima facie, the explanation. But also, three institutions that were really at the heart of this, Bear Stearns, Lehman, and Merrill Lynch, were just pure investment banks. So Glass-Steagall is irrelevant to these. Uh, Glass-Steagall is irrelevant to uh, Goldman Sachs. It's irrelevant to AIG, which was an investment firm. It's irrelevant to uh, New Century Financial. And when we look at Wachovia and Washington Mutual, they just made risky loans to homeowners. That's what brought them under. It was no special privilege that the partial repeal of Glass-Steagall had made available to them that led them into this behavior. They were just, what the banks did was not some newfangled thing that they were suddenly allowed to do. They were always allowed to have, to, to, to buy, uh, to se- have securitized loans and all that stuff. It was that they did old-fashioned bank things really badly. They made bad lending decisions. Uh, bank of America got into serious trouble, but largely because, not because it bought an investment bank, but because it bought Countrywide, which was a traditional mortgage lender. Also, it's worth noting the statistics on the regulatory bodies themselves. The the regulatory bodies actually saw their statistics uh, go up in terms of how many people were employed there, what their budgets were. Uh, Bob Murphy did some good work on this, but the SEC, for example, uh, its funding under George W. Bush increased at an 11.3% annualized rate as compared to a 6.8% rate under Bill Clinton, and its staff grew at 1% per year. Under Jimmy Carter, its staff fell by 1.2% per year. Spending on the regulatory agencies in charge uh, has tripled 
since so-called deregulation began around 1980. And then the, the BU, BU economist, um, Larry Kotlikoff, he's the guy who, who, in addition to other things, estimates the, the total of the capitalized value of the unfunded liabilities of the transfer programs. He's the one who comes up with the, the most recent figure is $222 trillion. Well, he also investigated how many state and federal agencies are there in charge of financial regulation. Answer is 115. And he sort of playfully suggests that it may be the case that just increasing that figure to 116 might not really solve the problem. Like maybe it wasn't that 115 was just one too few, and now if we have another one, then this won't happen. 